As we move into our prayer concerns and celebrations, um, just let me uh, share quickly that uh, we have two big birthdays coming up uh, this week. Uh, Helen Sells and Shirley Moore are both turning 93 this week. So, so we. Um, also, um, I don't know. Did, did Beth, did you want to share that concern? Where are you? <laughs> there you are. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. So remember Beth this week in your, in your prayers. Uh, other prayer concerns and celebrations? Bob. Oh, go ahead. Over here. Bob and Kay Hoffman. Bob has been in the hospital. Uh, okay. He's going to have another procedure done tomorrow. Uh, so we need to keep both of them and their daughter that usually comes with them in the prayers. Okay. Bob and Kay Hoffman. John? Yeah. I got a couple of praises. I'm glad to see Frank and Doris and Michael this morning. I think that's great. <laughs> As a lot of us know, the, the, the men's group that we meet on Wednesday morning, we all got together and a few extras and wives and stuff. And we went to Don and Helen's house and had breakfast, and it was great. Helen looked really good. Don looked pretty good for what it was. But we know Don's been pretty down lately and hasn't been really getting out and doing anything. Well, word has it that after we left, Don got up and wandered around his yard and got off his golf cart and terrorized the neighborhood. That's <laughs> 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 people that are home and can't get out and everything and get a little bit of encouragement and join them or not. It brings up their spirits, so let's, let's keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad for them. Thank you. So celebration for Don and prayer concerns for his neighbors. <laughs> All right. For my friend Paula and her husband as they go further south. And my husband and I are going to Wilmington to join his pyro ship. Navy ship reunion. All right. Fantastic. Traveling mercies for you both. All right. Yes. Yes. Good to see Bruce and Barbara. Yeah. Other prayer concerns and celebrations. Glad to see the church bowl. That's always a celebration. Yes. Good to see Joe with long pants on. 
So you can wear shorts anytime you want, Joe. <laughs> so. Good to see Betty and Keanu here. Yes, yes, good to see Betty back. I saw her earlier, where is she? All right, hey Betty. Prayers for Joe's leg. <laughs> Prayers for Joe's leg, all right. Any others? All right, let us pray. Amazing God, we thank you for the resource of prayer. We thank you and praise you for answered prayers. We have witnessed many of them. Uh, right here in our midst, and we're, we're thankful for that. We praise you for that. We, <clears throat> our faith is stronger because we see you at work in this community and in, in the lives of our loved, one, loved ones and friends. It gives us confidence to bring our concerns to you this morning. Those that were mentioned aloud those who, uh, those concerns that we hold silently in our hearts, uh, the concerns of those who are watching this online or hearing it, hearing the recording later, Lord, you know all those concerns. You know them better than we do. We, you know the needs better than we do. And so we just trust you with all of them, knowing that you'll bring comfort and and strength and wisdom and healing and power you will bring your perfect answer in each of those situations and so we just wait for you to show up in all of those Lord we pray for our world and the brokenness that we see in our community we pray for those who are struggling to make ends meet, those who are hungry, those who are homeless. We ask that you would empower your church, not just this church, but all churches, all brothers and sisters in Christ. Use us to meet those needs. Use us to, to shine a light. Use us to accomplish your work here and everywhere. Lord, we pray for um, places all around the world where there is violence. We especially pray for the violence in Ukraine right now. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. We ask that you would bring a peaceful resolution, that you would be with those who have been harmed, people who have lost loved ones. Lord, Prince of Peace, do your miraculous work in that situation. Lord, lead us into a deeper faith. Help us to see our, the, the next step forward that you're calling us to take. Help us to do it even when we're unsure and of ourselves. Help us to, to be sure of you and and the way that you equip us for that next step. Lord, we want to grow deeper into our relationship with you. Uh, Lord, heal our relationships with each other. Forgive us for the, the ways that we've hurt each other and the ways that we've grieved your heart. Forgive us, we pray, through the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to forgive each other as you have forgiven us. Help us to rebuild relationships as you have rebuilt relationships with us. May we more and more reflect your character in the ways that we relate uh, to other people. Lord, we praise you for who you are. <clears throat> we praise you for what you've done. We praise you most especially for the gift of your, of your son, Jesus Christ. 
who gave his life voluntarily to show us unequivocally what your character looks like, what your love can do for each of us. Lord, we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say today. Amen. Scripture today is taken from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as most of you know, we are talking about the practices of faith. Sometimes we call them the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines. Uh, but they're the things that we do on a regular basis. They're the habits. Another, habits is another way to talk about them. They're the things we do on a regular basis that put us in a position and in a space for God to transform us into the people that God has called us to be. Uh, and we've talked a lot about a lot of those. But today we talk about uh, a, a discipline or a practice that really combines several of the ones that we've already talked about. And that is seeking guidance uh, from God. Um, and in fact, that underneath all of the disciplines, kind of implied in all the disciplines, is that this is, we are seeking guidance from God on a regular basis. And the scripture that uh, was just read uh, are, uh, shows us that, that God desires for us to be guided and nurtured by a connection to God and, the, and these practices, all the things that we've talked about in the last several weeks um, are all about uh, our maintaining and nurturing and staying connected to God so that we will bear the fruit that God has designed us to, to, to produce. So a couple of things that seem very uh, obvious, but I think we need to just actually say them. God does want us to know what God's will is. He, he wants us to know what, uh, what he's thinking, what, what his plan is for us, what our, our next steps are. That is not uh, supposed to be a mystery. And sometimes people talk about that uh, as if, well, I don't know. What, 
Um, it's, you, if you don't know, it's not because God doesn't want you to. Uh, God does want us to know. God wants us to be connected. And uh, that connection naturally helps us be guided by the will of God. Uh, guidance grows out of our connection to God and people. What I just said, the, the vine and the branches. As we stay connected to the vine, it provides all that we need to grow. It provides all that we need to produce fruit. Um, and it also relates us to other people. As you think about uh, growing things, you think about trees, vines, all kinds of plants, uh, there's, more than, there's more than one offshoot. They are, we all have connections, uh, and those connections not only uh, rely on the, the vine, Jesus the vine, but they also affect one another. And so there's this relationship that I talk about all the time, loving God and loving people, and those two are intimately related. How we love God affects how we love people, and how we love people affects how we love God. Uh, both of those are true. So our connection to God and people grows out of these disciplines and practices, which was what we just said. And God's will for you is to be a blessing and to glorify your creator. That's, that's sort of the first thing to think about when you think about, am I being guided by God? Am I in the will of God? Am I doing what God wants me to do? Well, are you a blessing to other people? And are you glorifying the God that created you? Are you displaying the gifts that God has given you? Those are two things you can always be sure are in God's will for you. That you be a blessing to other people and that you glorify the God who created you. So that's the first part of it. It's just, am I a blessing? And do, does my life point to a, a glorious and wonderful creator who created me? So, uh, the source of this blessing is the fruit of the Spirit. And we've talked about that throughout this series. That if you want to know if the, these practices are doing their work, uh, all you have to do is ask yourself, are, is there uh, a greater abundance of the fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are those things growing in your life do others notice it is another part of it do others notice that those fruits are growing in your life uh, that's a sign that this is all working the practices of our faith God is using them to do the work in us is there fruit so today as we talk about guidance I really want to talk about it from a specifically uh, Methodist point of view uh, now, the, what I'm going to talk about is not, you, uh, we don't have a monopoly on this. Uh, other uh, traditions in the, in the Christian church talk about these same things, but we talk about them in a specific way. Uh, I don't know what your history is, but how many of you have ever heard of something called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral? All right, so like 10% of you, I think. So... <laughs> um, that's just a big word for saying that uh, what, and actually Wesley himself did not talk about quadrilateral, he didn't use that word. But uh, Wesleyan scholars have looked at uh, all the writings of Wesley and he, what they said was that Wesley talked about four primary ways that we're guided by God. Um, form four primary ways that sort of guide what we do as followers of Christ. And uh, one way to envision it is a stool uh, and script with scripture at the top. That scripture is primary uh, for, and we talked about this when we talked about study. That uh, yes, it's good to study and read other books, but we should read the Bible more than we read anything else. Uh, if, we, if we don't read anything else, we should read the Bible. Uh, Wesley called himself a man of one book. Even though he had one of the largest libraries uh, of his day, he, he's, he would always talk about himself as a man of one book because that one book was the center of all of it for him. So scripture is primary. Uh, studying scripture, reading scripture, was primary. 
Um, but underneath that and interrelated with that are tradition, reason, and experience. Uh, and Albert Outler, who is a Wesleyan scholar, talked about it like this. Wesley believed that the living core of the Christian faith was revealed in Scripture, illumined by tradition, uh, I shouldn't have used purple, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed by reason. So, uh, let's talk about those one at a time. Revealed in Scripture, and I, I'll just said this, Scripture is the primary source of discernment. Uh, that um, if one of the ways... The primary way in which we know what God wants us to do is that we read about it in Scripture. That we're informed by, that God uses Scripture to speak uh, into our lives and guide us forward uh, on a daily basis. So, Scripture is our primary source of discernment. Uh, now, one of the things I want to say about that is that even related to Scripture, there's an element of tradition. Um, the 66 books that we know, now know as, or what that we call the Bible, didn't just fall out of the sky uh, in a nice, neat book. It was a very messy process that took over 400, uh, over 400 years for the New Testament to kind of decide, for the church to decide what are the books that are most authoritative? What are the ones that we're going to use as the center of and core of our faith? So from the time that Jesus uh, was crucified and raised to the time that, the, that to we had those 27 books that we now know as the New Testament was about 400 years. Um, it wasn't for 400 years that we sort of nailed that down. So uh, there's 400 years of tradition involved in deciding what is scripture for us. There was a similar process with the Old Testament, which I'm not going to get into, or, uh, that, uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament. Um, those of you that may have, how many of you have some Catholic background? All right. Usually there are more hands, but because um, we tend to have a lot of uh, people with that background in, uh, in the Methodist Church. But um, if you have ever had a Catholic Bible, you know that there are more than 66. There are 80 books in the Catholic Bible. Uh, and so there's 14 extra called the Apocrypha. Uh, the, um, and even uh, Martin Luther, who was the leader of the uh, Protestant Reformation, talked about those 14 books as authoritative. Um, so this is ongoing. The, all, uh, all of that is to say that even when we talk about scripture, uh, tradition is informing it. Our, the, the, the struggle of tradition is always informing scripture. So revealed in scripture, uh, there's an element of tradition in that. And here's, the, here's the, the, the bottom line for each of us individually. Everybody has a canon within the canon. Uh, let me ask you, uh, let me look, kind of drive that home by asking the question, how many of you um, have favorite passage, Bible passages? Like things you just keep going back to that because you love to read them, they, they really affirm your faith, they really connect with you. And then how many of you have, so along with that question, to answer that question is this question, how many of you have books of the Bible that you never read? <laughs> right. I don't spend too much time in Leviticus. Uh, I, I don't remember the last time um, uh, I read uh, a lot of Numbers, the book of Numbers. Um, all those lists of names that are in the name. I don't go through those lists of names a lot. Um, so all of us have sort of favorites. Um, we call this the canon within the canon. Uh, and it's good to know that. It's good to acknowledge that and confess it because what it says to us is there's always more for us to learn. There are good things in Leviticus for us to learn. There are good things in Numbers. Uh, I say that um, with faith because I, I don't often get a lot of good stuff from those things, but I know they're there. And I, I continue to be surprised by encountering scriptures that I really haven't spent a lot of time with before. 
Um, even you know, those of you that get the, my daily devotion, you know we've been working through Matthew since August. I can't believe it's been that long, but we started in Matthew in August, and we're just now in, uh, we're getting ready to finish, probably in the next couple weeks before Easter, finishing the whole book of Matthew. I've never done that in-depth a study of the book of Matthew, and that's one of the Gospels. Uh, I've read some things in Matthew that I don't remember reading before. <laughs> and, and so Scripture can constantly surprise us. Uh, and so it's good to discipline ourselves to read more and more of Scripture, even sometimes Scripture that we haven't read or don't even like to read. It's the living word of God. We, and why do we call it that? Because Scripture's voice speaks to us in different situations and at different times. Um, there have been passages that I've encountered at different times in my life. And it, it, it's as if God was speaking a different word to me, using the same words on the page, speaking a different word to me because I was at a different place, a different um, situation and God had something new to say to me and he used that those words to speak to me in a new way so what we mean by living word is that it it has this life of its own that God can use it through the Holy Spirit to speak directly to us in different situations and at different times we don't always agree with about uh, about what scripture says and that's really talks speaks to tradition in fact that's sort of my segue into tradition is that uh, we can respect that um, sometimes we're not always going to agree on what scripture is 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 saying but the conversation is important so revealed in scripture uh, how, how do we practice this number one read scripture more habitually than you read anything else it's good to read other things, and we get a lot out of reading other things. But if you only read one thing, read Scripture, uh, and read it habitually. Read it daily if you can. Force yourself to read Scripture that you normally would not prefer. Force to re yourself to read Scripture that challenges you, that challenges your beliefs, because that's how we grow. We grow through challenge. We grow through doing things that we haven't done before. Um, and here's the thing, you've heard me say this before, it's it, reread scripture over and over and over. You don't get to just say, oh, well, I, 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 the other day I finished the Bible. I finished reading the Bible and so I'm done. I, I've read it all. No, we read it, we read it over and over and over because it is the living word. It continues to speak to us in a fresh way. Uh, and we talk about scripture with others. This is important. As we uh, talk about scripture and study scripture, it's good to hear how scripture is speaking to other people. How is it that, uh, and that's the, the value of things like the, the Bible study on Tuesday night, is that you get to hear how other people are, are receiving that same word. Uh, so that's a good thing, uh, is to always be talking, and that's the communal nature of our practices. So. And then finally, don't idolize scripture. The Bible is not God. It only points to God. Um, and, and so to put anything, to, to hold it up as, as something to be worshipped is, is not what God desires. Scripture is not God. Scripture points to God. We need to remember that's an important distinction. Uh, illumined by tradition. And, and this is the way that we honor the struggle of those before us. People for 2,000 years now, almost 2,000 years now, have been wrestling with what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ. We can benefit from that. We can learn things from them that we don't have to learn on our own because we have that tradition. We have the cumulative wisdom of the faith community for thou over thousands of years. So not just the 2,000 since Christ, but even the thousands of years before that in the, Judea, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition and the Jewish scripture, we have all of that wisdom uh, over thousands, gathered over thousands of years, which we can benefit and we don't have to discover all that truth all over again. We can rely on and, and place ourselves in the stream of that tradition. 
Tradition guards against an overly individualized faith. This is what, one of the many reasons why it's important for us to be part of a, a faith community is that we can get some, I don't know, on my own, I can come up with some pretty crazy ideas. Like, I, I think they're great until I share them with somebody else and they give me a look on, and they say, I don't, you are just so out in left field. Um, and, and so tradition guards about that. Tradition is our connection, to not just to our current community, but the community of faith over the ages. It speaks back to us and says, listen, you're a little off base here. <laughs> uh, and you, you need to think this a little more deeply. So tradition guards against an overly individualized, individualized faith. The other thing we acknowledge about tradition is that it changes slowly over time. Uh, it doesn't... It, Unlike scripture that remains the same, at least since uh, 397 uh, AD, it doesn't change. Tradition uh, changes over time, and we just acknowledge that. How do we practice this? Number one, learn your tradition well. Study uh, the Methodist church and study Methodist beliefs. Uh, you'll hear a lot of that. I've committed to teaching them as, mu as well as I can. Learn our tradition well. And then also, as you learn your tradition well, read and hear from other traditions uh, and other time periods. Uh, the Methodist Church has not remained the same uh, since its inception as the Methodist Episcopal Church in the 18th century. Uh, we've gone through several transitions. It's interesting to, if you go back and read how things were uh, 300 years ago at the beginning, at our beginnings and where we are now. Uh, we can learn things by doing those, doing that kind of research and doing that kind of discovery. So reading other and hearing from other traditions, talking with others about issues of traditions. Uh, some of the most fruitful discussions I've ever had are with uh, having discussions from people with people from other faiths. As I talk about something that's important to me, they say that sounds a little like what. Uh, something that I experience and one of my convictions and, I, and we get to grow from each other. We work to understand and respect other traditions. Uh, and as we do that, one of the things I've found is that it make, gives me a deeper love for my own tradition. Uh, and I, it helps me realize the strength of my own tradition. Just like the Bible, we don't idolize tradition. We don't say we've always done it that way because tradition changes over time. God is always doing something new. So vivified uh, in experience, personal experience, um, how is scriptural truth confirmed by your personal experience? How has what you learn from scripture, maybe you've even heard it in tradition, how is that connecting with your life? How, do you see that truth? Do you see that scriptural truth in your life? Do you see it in your relationships? Um, when you hear um, one, of the, one of the writers of scriptures talking about relationships and how they work, do you see that in your own relationships? And you think, oh... Uh, that's what I did wrong. That's, that's, what I, that's where I went off course is that I wasn't following the scriptural principle. Or we follow the a scriptural principle and, we, and it makes a difference. In other words, there should be a connection between our study of scripture and our experience uh, every, in everyday life. Another question we can ask ourselves about personal experience is how does our experience compare and contrast to the experience of others? Again, this is a communal, communal faith that we're called to, not an individualized one. And the, other, the strength of that is that so often I'll share in my experience of something and somebody will say, I've experienced this very same thing. And it's one of the clues that God is doing something uh, in a community is that several different people are sensing the same thing and having the same experience. And you say, wow, there's the Holy Spirit is at work because I was, hadn't talked to them about that, but I'm seeing that the same thing is happening with them that's happening with me. I'm getting the same feeling about what we should be doing 
as that person and that person and that person. Uh, it's, our experience gives us a clue. So what can we learn from the experience of others? This is why it's important to have small groups where we can have conversations with each other because we, we help each other grow that way. We learn from the experience of others, not just our, and then they learn from our experience as well. So, how does scriptural truth become alive in our experience, in our life and relationships? It's an individual and communal, communal faith. And then finally, so, scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. It's confirmed by reason. And we'll just say a couple of things about that. We have a rational faith. You don't have to, you don't have to subscribe to some crazy idea. Um, our faith makes sense. Uh, and and it, we don't have to... See, I, I, I hate it to see when um, in our culture, even in some writings and within the Christian church, that there's this sense that there is science against faith. No, it's a, it's a wonderful conversation between science and faith because science continues to confirm things that faith has, pe people of faith have known for thousands of years. Uh, science and faith should work one, with, with one another, not against each other. Our faith is rational. It makes sense. We, God has given us the ability to reflect and reason and think, and we should use it. Now, why would God give that gift if we weren't supposed to use it? Um, Paul Tillich talked about uh, our, this rational expression of faith as loving God with the mind. He called theology loving God with the mind. Uh, and so it's a gift, and if it's a gift of God, we should be using it. So how do we practice this? Number one, we make time and space to reflect on issues of faith. If we don't spend time reflecting, that's why we talk about um, uh, study, the practice of study. We talk about the practice of meditation. This gives us the time and space to think about issues and dwell on issues of faith. And it builds our muscle. It builds our spiritual muscle. It builds our our thinking and reflecting muscles uh, and, and our ability to reason and find the connections in, in our faith is confirmed by our ability to reason. And then I say this every chance I get, be a lifelong learner. Um, if, if you're not learning something, then you're not growing. Learning is growing. So w I would just ask you, what are you learning right now? What are you learning on purpose? What are you learning, seeking to learn intentionally right now? That increases our ability to reason and draw connections with our faith. Be a lifelong learner. And then listen to talk and, and talk to others about what they're thinking. Again, our other people's thinking connect, corrects ours sometimes. We realize uh, I was a little crazy uh, when, in thinking about that. So, uh, that's the strength of our community. So the invitation, sort of your homework uh, this, today. And by the way, I want to say thank you to those of you who's, who turned in and sent me things. That, we talked about gratitude last week. And I challenged you to find two things that you're thankful for every day. Some of you took that seriously and actually gave me a list. Um, I love some of the things that, that were on some of the lists I got. Uh, hairspray. Somebody said they're real thankful for hairspray. But so, uh, I got a little off key there, but, uh, but uh, here is the, the uh, homework for this week. Take one personal issue of faith, uh, maybe one that you've been thinking about already, and apply the four things that we just talked about to it this week, intentionally. What does scripture say about it? Uh, what does our tradition say about it? What does the United Methodist tradition say about it? Uh, what do you say about it? What do you think about it? How does it connect to your experience? To think about the one issue, but think about it from those four perspectives. And then maybe look for a, a, a thread that runs through all four. 
as a way of looking for what is God saying to me about this particular issue. It can be a personal issue, it can be an issue that the whole world is facing, it can be something in your family. What does scripture say about it? What does our tradition say about it? What do you say about it? What do you think about it as you reflect on it? How has that issue played out in your experience? This is discernment. This is the practice of discernment. Uh, and I assure you that if we seek, the scripture says this, if we seek answers, we will find them. Um, so do that this week. Take that issue, apply these four things to it. See what God might be saying to you about that issue that you're seeking discernment or, or guidance on. Uh, as we uh, move uh, to our closing hymn, let us pray. Gracious God, we know that you have a, a plan for us. You, we know that you have a next step for each of us. We know that you have a next step for this church, for our families. Lord, we know that you want to guide us. So Lord, help us to do the things that will, help, that will open our hearts to the ways in which you're guiding us. Speak to us through your word. Speak to us through the, the very rich tradition that we have in the Methodist faith. Speak to us through the exercise of our own minds. Help us draw connections between the things that we know and the things that we see. And then, Lord, speak to us through our experience. What is it that our life is telling us right now? And then, Lord, help us, once we have discerned what you're saying to us, help us to act, help us to move forward in our faith. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Help us to be more faithful to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, obviously, it's a wonderful song for us to end up on. Let us stand as we sing, as we sing, He Leadeth Me. And now may God go before you to defend you and go behind you to protect you 
and go beside you to befriend you. They can go beneath you to uphold you, rest above you to bless you, and dwell within you to comfort you now and forevermore. Amen.